Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If this is your very first time here, and you're somebody who enjoys listening to horror stories, join us by clicking subscribe down below to stay up to date with my daily uploads. Please leave a like before we get started. Among the rolling hills of Massachusetts lived my friend Piers. Piers were the right weird folk. Him and his family were always outside. Whether they be farming, or whether they be chasing their dog around like headless idiots. My friend Piers wasn't exactly the type of guy you'd expect to be at a club, a bar, or anywhere where there were huge congregations of people. Having said that, Piers was easy to get along with, and I guess this is what stuck me to him. He was like a magnet, and me being so quiet and antisocial, I was drawn to his confidence. It's weird, because Piers had no confidence, but at the same time, he had so much. It really depended on which situation Piers was in. When it came to talking to girls, he absolutely fucking loved it. I don't know why, because he hasn't had much luck with them, but to him, it was like a fun game, some kind of a sick dare, where it didn't really matter what the girl thought of him, the whole point of the interaction was just for him to have fun and enjoy life. I used to love being around him when there were girls, whether it be at high school or eventually college, he was so entertaining, and believe it or not, the girls would actually like it. They would giggle, pat him on the back, or come up to him and ask him why he was so funny. I guess they saw him as the Joker. He's not particularly attractive, and he's not very tall. But, he had game, and I'll give him that. Me and Piers hadn't had a girlfriend, and we were already 22 years old. I reckon Piers could have pulled, but he just didn't really care. He enjoyed socialising with the girls at college, but whenever college was over, that was it. College stayed at college, and he didn't want anything to do with that to come back to his family home. Piers' mum and dad were strict. His mum worked full-time in the house as a housewife slash parent, and his dad used to work for a company which supplied these weird portaloos. I didn't really talk to his dad much, as most of the time he was never home, but his mum's nice enough. She used to cook us food in the evenings. I spent a lot of time round Piers' house, more so when I was younger, but I still do occasionally now. The holidays were just around the corner, and Piers was planning an idea. We were supposed to be going on holiday, but it turned out that that was a last minute decision, so I chose to opt out. Piers wanted me to come with him camping. I figured that that would be a much better option. So, we needed to go grab some gear. Where did we go? Yeah, Walmart. Not the best place for professional level camping gear. But, it'll make do. Whilst we were walking around, we bumped into a girl that we knew from college. Piers does his usual shit, and it's absolutely hilarious. I couldn't contain my laughter and I wanted to burst out in crying fits, like I used to when I was 8 years old. Piers had just kicked off a great holiday season, with the funniest interaction I have ever seen. And what topped it all off? The girl actually liked it. No, she didn't give him her number. He didn't ask for hers either. But they just left on mutual terms, laughing and having a great time. We finished shopping for our tents, camping gear, seats, stoves, etc. And the bill came to a mouth-watering $380. That's worrying, especially when you're two broke college students. But I guess it was worth it, as this holiday was going to be like no other. When we got back to Piers' house, we started collecting everything and organising what we were going to take with us. Piers' dad said that he could take the van, 
This would allow us to take way more stuff with us, and obviously it would mean we wouldn't have to sit in a crammed car, as Piers' car was tiny. We got loading up his dad's van, gave it a quick wash beforehand to keep him happy, and then set off to our campsite, which was around a three hour drive. The drive wasn't very fun, as I tend to get travel sick, even while driving in cars. I may have puked a couple times in my bag, but that detail should probably be kept out of the story, especially if any of you are eating. Sorry. When we arrived at the campsite, it was pretty busy. It was to be expected though. There were families left, right and centre, screaming kids, babies yelling their mouths off, and of course grandmas that looked completely lost, asking us where the toilets were. Where were we supposed to know? We didn't. We'd never been here before, and it was all Piers' idea. I thought you said it wasn't going to be busy, I turned and said to him. And how was I supposed to know that? He replied. We looked a bit angry at each other, because I don't like people, and neither does Piers in certain situations, and I could tell that this situation for Piers was one of the bad ones. We got to our pitch and started setting up both of our tents. It took us around 40 minutes to get everything prepared. We arrived at the campsite at around 4pm as we stopped off for lunch and spent a few hours in a nearby town. Once we were all set up, we decided to get our camping chairs and just relax. Piers came up with the idea of grabbing some firewood and then making a fire. The rest of this evening was going to be a chill out evening as travel had taken it out of both of us, and made us feel like lazy sloths. We opened a couple cans of beer, and just sipped away. At around 8pm, one of the wardens came round and asked Piers to move his truck, claiming that apparently it was obstructing one of the pitches next to ours. Yeah, it wasn't. That ranger was an absolute dick. Oh well, he left, and Piers did move it. So... We weren't looking to make any enemies on our first night of staying here. We finished drinking our beers and just chatting. The fire was nice, but the kids screaming in the background wasn't. The first night was over. We head into our tents after using the toilets and brushing our teeth in the basins. The toilets were pretty clean, and all in all this campsite had a 5 star rating. Except the funny thing was, a couple of people had complained about the wardens, saying that they were rude and extremely creepy. I found that funny. When I woke up the next morning, I got woken up by the sun at around 4.30am. I know right, what a fucking nightmare. It made me regret going to bed at 1am, so when you only have 3 hours sleep, you feel like an absolute dog the next day. I got out of my tent, realising that there was no way I could get back to sleep. It was an extremely sunny day, people had already gotten up around the tent, and they were making a whole bunch of noise. And on top of that, I didn't even have an eye mask, so I couldn't block the sunlight out and get a few more hours. I got up and went to the toilet, took a shower, and then dried myself off. By the time I got back to my pitch, Piers was up also. He was sat in the camping chair, looking at the burnt and crumbled embers from the night before. Bro, what are we doing today then? Piers says to me. Right, well, how about you just look on your phone and come up with an idea? I said to him in reply. We spent a couple of minutes looking on his phone, activities and ideas to do in and around this campsite. It turns out there was quite a lot, but then we realised as it's the holidays, we wanted to pick something that would avoid having kids or families. After arguing about what to do, we finally decided to drive into the town and go to an arcade for a few hours. Stupid decision right? Yeah. Full of kids, full of families. Pretty pissed off and feeling a bit stressed out, we decided to head back to the campsite. When we got back there, we got onto the topic of girls. Me and Piers wouldn't usually talk about girls, as I knew Piers found it extremely awkward to talk about them to me. He knew deep down that it was awkward, because he was so natural around them, yet would never make the move. 
You see, it's like he expected the girl just to jump on his lap. But she wasn't going to do that. Because, well, she's a girl, right? Once we got talking about girls, I could see Piers' face starting to go red. At some point in the conversation, it led down the road of dating apps. And that's when I decided that I wanted to convince Piers to sign up to Tinder. I thought it would be a funny game, because if he can talk to the girls wittily, then why can't he type to them in a wittily manner? That's what we tried. So, step by step, as we sat there on our pitch in the camping chairs, I guided Piers through setting up his Tinder profile. He didn't have many great pictures, and like I said, he's not great looking, so we had to structure them specifically. Pictures of his farmland, him with his dogs, him out shooting, etc. Then he did write a funny bio, but I think it was a bit hit and miss. Eventually, we made the profile live, and we started swiping away. He got told that he couldn't swipe anymore after around 30 swipes, which kind of sucked, because a lot of the girls in the area were really attractive. Five minutes later, after being told he can no longer swipe, his phone started pinging. He took it out his pocket and checked. It turns out he had matched with a girl. Not just any girl. The girl that we had bumped into at Walmart in our hometown. Her name was Mackenzie. She went to our college, and I could tell that she liked peers. But I wasn't expecting what was about to happen next. Piers made a bit of a stupid decision to not only send her videos and photos of our campsite, but also share the live location. Yeah, you guessed it. Mackenzie, three to four hours later, at around 10 p.m., decided that she was going to travel all the way to the campsite, taking an Uber, then forcing Piers to pay for it, embarrassing him, me, and the Uber driver, and making Piers around $500 less. This was only the beginning, however. Mackenzie then came over to the campsite pitch and proceeded to sit on Piers' lap. Now, at this point, Piers was still doing well. He seemed like a natural and was actually charming her up. But for me, this was extremely awkward. I felt like I was no longer welcome in this area. So, I made the decision just to go to bed early, just to help her bro out. Well, it turns out I would have helped him out if I stayed with him. Because what happened next, I would have never expected. And it's the reason he's still paying child support years later. So, as I get in my tent, I start hearing some making out, kissing, noises. It's typical and to be expected. But I should have warned Piers. No girl that's normal will travel four hours to come and see you at a moment's notice, unless there's something weird going on. I tried to get some sleep, but the noises of Piers and Mackenzie kept getting louder and louder until eventually I was pretty sure the whole campsite could hear. At one point around midnight, one of the wardens was called, he came up to our pitch, drove up with his quad bike, and held his horn, as if to say, shut up and keep the noise down. It was embarrassing. Mackenzie was extremely vocal, and I just remember her screaming and moaning at the top of her lungs. No doubt Piers felt embarrassed, but no doubt he was also enjoying it. After it was all over, it was around 1 in the morning. I know, it went on for ages. But Piers had remembered something. He didn't wear protection. And Mackenzie, well, had she taken the pill? Question mark. She left the same night, and no one knows where she went or how she got back home. But after this, three months later, she messaged Piers saying, I'm pregnant. That's how the nightmare began. Piers didn't take precaution and thought that Mackenzie was going to herself, putting responsibility in the woman, a woman who was clearly mad. That's how Mackenzie locked Piers down and ended up forcing him to pay child support for years upon years. Piers changed after that. 
He stopped being the charming guy when talking to all girls, and I think he saw a piece of Mackenzie in every younger girl he saw. It was like a hatred. It was like a disdain. He ended up having to get a full-time job, and the court continually ordered him to pay child support, even though Mackenzie didn't want to live with him anymore, and he offered for her to come and live at the family farm. The family farm would have been the perfect setting. It has over four houses on it, yet for some reason she didn't want to live with him. So, be careful guys. Piers found out the hard way, and realised that there are actually some girls out there, yes, a very minute percentage, that are looking to trap guys, and actually use them as cash cows. It's pretty disgusting, and I have to say, that whenever I saw Mackenzie in college after this, I would look the other way and just completely ignore her. She knew me as Piers' friend, and for a while tried to get to him through me, but I wasn't allowing any of her shit. That's damn evil. It was a warm summer evening in Miami. I received an invitation to my friend Ethan's birthday party at his parents' mansion. His parents were pretty cool, but I wasn't usually invited to anything to do with Ethan, so I was kind of surprised and excited when he asked me to come to his party. Ethan's family was known for owning a successful car warranty company and they sure knew how to throw a party in style. As I arrived, I was greeted by the sight of elegantly dressed guests mingling by the poolside. The mansion was huge. It has chandeliers, pillars, five bathrooms, 12 bedrooms, and even two kitchens. Oh, and did I mention marble flooring and expansive glass walls overlooking the waters of the pool? Ethan was dressed in a tailored suit, and he greeted me with a warm smile and a firm handshake before leading me to the outdoor bar. The atmosphere was buzzing with energy as the DJ spun lively tunes that had everyone dancing and laughing. The pool was lit up with underground lighting, and I have to say, it was kind of weird. The air was filled with the delicious aroma of gourmet food being served by waitstaff. I found myself sucked into conversations with Ethan's friends, most of which I'd never seen in my entire life. As the night went on, the party only got better. Guests were treated to an incredible fireworks display that painted the night sky in all different colours and definitely pissed off the neighbours. The bar was always constantly stocked up with top shelf liquor and the laughter and music filled the air. I found myself sipping on a cocktail as I soaked in the atmosphere of the party, feeling grateful and a kind of bit lucky that I'd been invited to such an extravagant event. The energy was infectious, and I let myself be swept away by the party's magic. Dazzling lights, pulsating music, and the laughter of friends was all around me. As the night wore on, I indulged in a few too many drinks, letting loose and immersing myself in the revelry. At some point, I found myself engaged in a lively conversation with a girl whose name I still can't quite recall. She was hot, her laughter like music to my ears. We got talking, shared some stories and jokes, and talked as if we'd known each other for years. It was definitely alcohol at play, that was for sure. Eventually, the drinks took their toll, and the exhaustion crept up on me. I could feel the buzz in my head, and the heaviness in my limbs, as I searched for a comfortable spot to rest. The girl I'd been talking to guided me to a cosy lounge chair by the pool, where I settled in, 
feeling the cool breeze against my skin, and soothing sounds of the water lulling me into a state of relaxation. Before I knew it, everything went dark, and the events of the night were blending into a hazy dream. When I woke up the next morning, the sun was already high in the sky, and the remnants of the party littered the grounds everywhere. I blinked, trying to piece together what actually happened. It took me a good ten minutes to realise I was at Ethan's parents' house, and I felt like I was in a whole bunch of trouble, as most people are gone by this point. Beside me, the girl from the party lay peacefully asleep, her head resting on my shoulder. I couldn't help but smile at the randomness of the situation, feeling a mix of amusement and attraction. I woke up with a pounding headache, the morning after Ethan's wild birthday party at his parents' mansion in Miami. I tried to gather my thoughts, and I realised that I was still right next to the girl, whom I vaguely remembered meeting at the party. She was sleeping next to me, lying on one of the chairs. Memories of the night started flooding back, the music, the drinks, and the laughter. But what stood out the most was this girl's affectious smile. It had drawn me in like a damn magnet, and I couldn't remember if we'd slept together or not. That's how bad my hangover actually was. As I watched her wake up, I was admiring her for a moment, until eventually she caught me staring at her. She glanced at me, a hint of recognition flashing in her eyes, before she grabbed her phone. I didn't understand what she was about to do, and I dare not ask. I watched as she scrolled through what appeared to be the Tinder app. My heart sank when she giggled and started typing a message to someone. It dawned on me that she was inviting a random guy from Tinder to Ethan's parents' house, without his knowledge, and most certainly without mine. What are you doing? I asked, trying to keep my voice calm. She looked at me sheepishly. Oh, just uh, inviting someone over. Don't worry, it's no big deal. But it was a big deal. A really big deal. Before I could intervene, Yep, the doorbell rang, echoing through the house like a warning bell. I exchanged a panicked look with the girl, who seemed unfazed by the potential consequences of her actions. As she went to answer the door, I scrambled to get dressed and figure out how to handle the situation. I was in nothing but my underwear, and I had no idea how I ended up like this, as it wasn't a particularly hot night. Before I could even formulate a plan, a tall man barged into the gated area. His eyes looked pretty pissed off. Where's Sarah? He demanded, his voice sounding, yeah, pretty pissed off. Confusion clouded my mind as I still tried to quickly pull on my pants and put on my t-shirt. I was trying to process the situation and figure out what the hell was actually going on. Sarah... That was the name of the girl that I'd met, and now, standing in front of me, was a complete stranger who had been lured here under false pretenses. I think you have the wrong house, I tried to reason with him, holding up my hands in a placating gesture. But he wasn't having any of it. In a swift motion, he threw a punch that caught me off guard, sending me falling backwards. All of a sudden, I picked myself back up, and my jaw exploded with pain. My head started spinning, and once again, I had no idea where I was. Before I could even react, the guy lunged at me. He started pummeling my face and punching me, showing me absolutely no mercy whatsoever. I remember trying to defend myself, but his rage seemed unending. Blood was roared in my eyes as I struggled to push him off to absolutely no avail. Just when I thought I couldn't take any more and actually thought I was about to die, the punches soon stopped. It turns out Ethan had pulled him off of me 
and was trying to help me not die. As the adrenaline began to subside, the pain in my body became searingly apparent. I was wincing so bad that I was genuinely embarrassed at what this girl now thought of me. On the other hand, I was just happy that Ethan had pretty much saved my life. The guy ran off while Ethan helped me to my feet. He looked worried as hell. What in the world just happened? He asked. I recounted the events leading up to this stranger's violent outburst, leaving out the part about Sarah's role in the chaos. Ethan listened in disbelief. His eyes widened with each detail I shared. I can't believe this, he muttered, running a hand through his hair. I'm so sorry, man. I had no idea she would pull something like this. Despite the pain coursing through my body, I couldn't help but feel a sense of sympathy for Ethan. It was his birthday celebration that had spiralled out of control, and now he was left to pick up the pieces of a mess he didn't create. As we tried to make sense of the morning's events, the girl in question slipped out of the room with a guilty look on her face. I knew then that our paths would likely never cross again, our brief encounter leaving behind a trail of chaos and confusion. Eventually, I left and went home. My injuries weren't life-threatening, but I'll tell you what, they damn well hurt for weeks, and even a whole month. I think they would have hurt a whole lot more if I hadn't have been shit-faced drunk and completely hungover when it happened. Who was that guy? I don't remember him or his name. And as for Sarah, well, she just left and ran off with him. I don't know if you can class this as a Tinder story, but I guess it's related. Or would it be a birthday horror story? I found myself standing in the middle of a dense forest at 3 o'clock in the morning, surrounded by nothing but the haunting whispers of the night. My heart was thumping as I realised how far I had ventured from civilization. What started as a reckless decision to meet a guy I matched with on Tinder had now turned into a nightmare that I couldn't escape. The guy, let's call him Alex, has suggested we meet in this secluded forest for a unique date experience. Naively, and pretty self-unconcerning, I agreed, thinking it would be adventurous and exciting in my life, which was boring and numbing. As we walked deeper into the forest, the trees seemed to close in around us. Alex suddenly turned to me, with a rather funny grin, and suggested that we play a game of tag. You have to understand, guys, up until this point, I didn't really care about my life. So, if he did abduct me, or kill me, I don't think I would have really cared. He was hot, and I did kind of trust him, because I knew deep down that he was a little weird, but in a good way. In the dark, in the middle of the forest, at 3am, I hesitated, trying to make my growing unease hidden. We started running through the trees, our laughter echoing through the silent night. But as minutes turned into hours, the game took a pretty bad turn. The darkness became so bad that I couldn't really see anything. I tried to keep up with Alex, but the fear of getting lost somehow made me run slower, and my feet started to feel heavier and heavier every single step. I called out to him to stop. My voice was pretty panicky, but he only laughed and just ran faster, disappearing into the shadows ahead. We didn't have any lights on, so 
we were only going off what our eyes had somehow acclimatised to. I stumbled slightly on the undergrowth. My mind conjured up all sorts of terrifying scenarios. What if there were wild animals lurking out here? What if we stumbled upon something that we shouldn't be looking at? Finally, unable to bear it any longer, I screamed at the top of my lungs for Alex to stop. The forest fell silent, the echoes of my scream were fading into the night, and then suddenly, he did stop. He emerged from out of nowhere, his face covered and looking like he was about to kill me. I saw something in his eyes, it looked like he wanted to kill me, but... I didn't actually believe he would. Without a word, Alex turned and started walking back the way we came. I decided that I'd follow him, so I did, all the while my entire body shaking with fear and adrenaline. The walk back felt like an eternity, each snap of a trig sending me with a state of heightened alertness. When we finally emerged from the forest, I practically ran to Alex's car in the parking lot. My heart was still pounding in my chest. As he drove me back home in tense silence, I realised that that was the dumbest date I'd ever gone on. What was I even thinking? As I stepped out of the car and watched Alex drive away into the night, I knew that I would never forget the terror I'd experienced in those dark woods. And as I locked the door behind me, I made a silent promise to myself that I would never let curiosity or boredom lead me into dangerous situations again. After all, I may not care for my life, but my parents and family do, and it was a pretty dumb decision. It was a night I would never forget, a night that would forever be in my memory, as a reminder that there are some weird guys out there. I'm pretty sure he had autism, and some other things wrong with him, but he found joy in my own fear, if that makes sense. Weird one, but I thought I'd leave it here. It all started in kindergarten. I still remember that morning when Layla walked up into our classroom. She was different, but to me that wasn't a bad thing. If anything, it made me more drawn to her. Her eyes were sparkling, and she had a beaming smile that liked up even the darkest of rooms. Layla suffered from Down syndrome, but to me, she was just Layla my best friend in the whole wide world. From that day on, Layla and I became inseparable. We did everything together, played on the swings, shared our snacks during break time, and giggled endlessly at our inside jokes. Layla had this incredibly ability to see the world in a way that no one else could. Her creativity knew no bounds. She saw beauty in the smallest of things, a butterfly fluttering by, a rainbow after the rain, or a simple daisy blooming amongst the grass. Layla had a heart of gold. She was always there for me, offering a hug when I needed it, or a listening ear when I had a bad day. Despite facing challenges due to her condition, Layla never once complained. Instead, she radiated kindness and love wherever she went. Her sweet soul touched everyone she met, and it was impossible not to be drawn to her affectuous personality. As the years went by, Laylee and I grew up together. We navigated the ups and downs of school, faced the nasty kids who used to take the piss out of her and didn't really understand her uniqueness, and we'd celebrate each other's triumphs. Through it all, Layla remained. She would never leave me, and for some weird reason, 
always wanted to hang around with me, even with her condition really making things hard to maintain the friendship. One day, as we sat under our favourite oak tree in the schoolyard, Layla turned to me with her charismatic twinkle in her eye. Do you know why I see the world differently? She asked, her voice soft but full of wisdom beyond her years. I shook my head, eager to hear what she was about to say. Loving the world and everyone in it makes me see things differently. When you see with your heart... Everything becomes... pure. Layla explained, her words sinking deep into my soul. Back then I didn't really understand what she meant, but now, being an adult and looking back at what she said as me, when we were both kids, it makes total sense. That was Layla, always seeing the good in people, always spreading love and joy wherever she went. She taught me that kindness is a superpower, and that embracing our differences only makes us stronger. As we entered high school, Layla faced new challenges, but she met them with a resilience that left me in awe. She joined the school drama club, and discovered a passion for acting. Her performances on stage were nothing short of magical, captivating the audience with her raw talent and genuine emotion. Layla's creativity knew no bounds. She used to do painting, even telling stories, and also reading. Oh, and did I mention that she also used to talk out poems, ones she wrote? Despite the hurdles that Layla faced, she never gave up, and she always stayed strong in her belief that anything was possible if you put your heart into it. Her faith in the goodness of humanity inspired me to be a better person, to see the world through her eyes, with love, acceptance, and boundless optimism. Now, as we stand on the brink of adulthood, I look at Layla and see not just my best friend, but a shining example of what it means to embrace life with open arms. She has taught me about kindness, love, and creativity, and more than any textbook ever could. Layla had been my best friend for many years now. She's always possessed a warmth that radiates from within her. One day, Layla excitedly told me about a new match she found on Tinder. This is fast forwarding around a whole decade and a half, just to give you guys context. I had no idea she was using dating apps, and quite frankly, when she told me, I thought it was a pretty bad idea. She couldn't contain her joy as she explained that she had come across someone who shared her condition. It was like a miracle to her, a sign that perhaps love was within her reach too. I smiled at her enthusiasm, feeling happy that she had discovered a connection that brought her so much hope. As the days passed, Layla and her Tinder match exchanged messages. They decided to meet in person for a date at a local bar, and the thrill in Layla's eyes were unbelievable. The guy that she had matched with also seemed to suffer from Down syndrome. I didn't look for too long, as Layla was always a bit uncomfortable with me holding her phone. I agreed to drop her off and pick her up on the date, determined to ensure that she had a safe and enjoyable time. I'll be honest, I was a lot worried for her, but she's an adult now, so it's not like I can just control her life, and her parents were more than happy for this to go ahead. The evening arrived, and Layla was a bundle of nerves and excitement as we drove to the bar where she was meeting her date. When we arrived, I helped her out of the car and watched as she nervously smoothed down her dress eager to meet the person who had captured her heart. I promised to wait for her in the parking lot, keeping a close eye on her from a distance. Time seemed to stretch endlessly as I waited, wondering what was actually happening. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I noticed a figure approaching her at the bar. My heart leaped in my chest as I realised that it wasn't the person from the Tinder profile. 
Okay, who is that? Is a random guy just going up to talk to her? Is he hitting on her? Maybe asking if she's okay? Should I go in and help? I genuinely had no idea what to do here, and it was a situation where I felt like an absolute mess mentally. Panic set in as I saw Layla's confused expression, realizing that something was wrong, and probably wondering why this random stranger was coming up to her. As the stranger began to engage her in conversation, I saw the flicker of uncertainty in Layla's eyes. I had been her friend since we were around 4 years old, so I'd learned her body language, and I basically knew her pretty well. I knew that this was a catfish, around about 10 minutes into the conversation. It was a cruel deception that could shatter Layla's trust and happiness. Without a second thought, I rushed into the bar, determined to protect her from any harm. Layla, we need to go now, I said, firmly, while pushing past this guy. I was trying to hide my fear and anger at the deception that had unfolded before us. Layla looked up at me with confusion and a touch of hurt in her eyes, not understanding why I was now taking away from her date. Well, in Layla's eyes, her date was still coming, and this guy was just a random stranger who shouldn't have been talking to her. But I knew that this was what was happening. I just had a gut feeling. I quickly picked her bag up and helped her off the bar stool. Then we got out of the bar. I had a protective arm around her as we made our way back to the car. My mind was racing with a million scenarios of what could have happened if I hadn't have intervened. Layla could have been kidnapped, hurt, or worse, all because of heartless acts of deceit. As we drove home in silence, I could feel Layla's disappointment. I think she thought that I had just stopped it, stopped the date altogether for whatever reason. For a while, she was crying in the passenger seat, but I tried to explain to her what catfishes were and why that guy did that to her. But every time I said it, she wouldn't believe me, thinking that I just took her away and somehow her date was just late. I struggled to find the right words to offer her comfort, knowing that no words could erase the sting of betrayal that she must have been feeling. In the days that followed, Layla slowly began to heal from the shock and disappointment of that night. As she was navigating the world of online dating, I realized that I needed to be with her every step of the way. I stood by her side, ready to protect her from any more heartbreak. Despite the pain and betrayal that Layla experienced, her spirit never gave up. She continued to light up the world with her smile and laughter, reminding me every day of the strength and beauty that lay within her. In the quiet moments we shared together, I knew that Layla's heart was full of love, ready to give and receive without fear or hesitation. Layla's journey taught me the power of friendship, the importance of standing up for those who are vulnerable and that we love. We faced the challenges and the joys of life together. I knew that Layla would always hold a special place in my heart and that for as long as I was alive, I would most definitely take care of her. In a world that often feels harsh and unkind, a world that's looking to take advantage of the most vulnerable, Layla was like a beacon of light, a reminder that true beauty lies simply in the soul. A smile, a hug, a kind word, she is my best friend, my kindred spirit, and my eternal muse, as I look at Layla, her eyes still sparkling with that same spark of curiosity and wonder she had at four years old, wandering into that kindergarten, I know that no matter where life takes us, we will always be there for each other, and I will never leave her side. Thank you guys.
I just finished scrolling through some hilarious memes on my phone, and there was this one that cracked me up so much that I decided to share it with a guy I was talking to on Tinder at that very moment. Without thinking twice, I highlighted the URL and thought that I hit the copy button. However, I must have made a pretty bad mistake. Instead of pasting the meme, I somehow didn't paste it, and what I had pasted earlier was the address of where I lived to send to my friend who had just moved back from uni. How on earth did I manage that blunder? I felt the colour drain from my face as I stared at the screen in disbelief, trying to panicking and quickly delete the message. I tried to delete the message, but it was too late. The address was out there, sent to some random guy on Tinder, and I genuinely felt terrified. I nervously waited for a response, half hoping he would just ignore it, but the notification sound on my phone shattered that hope. It was a message from the guy whom I had inadvertently invited over to my house. The message read, I'm outside your address. Where do I find you? Question mark. My heart skipped a beat. What should I do? I couldn't just ignore him, could I? That would be rude. Besides, he might take offence. And who knows what he would do if I left standing outside my house. With shaky fingers, I typed out a response. Wait, what? That was a mistake. Please ignore the address. Please don't come over. Leave now. There was no response for over a few minutes. But then, the doorbell rang. Yep, I peeked through the window, and there he was, standing on my doorstep. He looked quite friendly, but the situation was far from normal. I tried to reason with him through the closed door, but he seemed insistent on talking to me in person. Why did I have to be so clumsy? The situation was escalating so fast, and I needed to think on my feet. After a brief moment of contemplation, I decided to call the police. I explained the bizarre situation to the dispatcher, emphasizing that I felt threatened and needed assistance immediately. She assured me that officers were on their way and advised me to stay put, and avoid engaging with the stranger outside. I watched from a safe distance as the police arrived and approached a guy at my door. They spoke to him for a while, presumably checking his intentions and verifying his identity. After a while, the officers came to my house and briefed me on the situation and what had ended up happening. As it turned out, The guy was genuinely confused by the unexpected address message and had decided to check if it was a genuine invitation or a prank. He had no ill intentions and was simply curious according to him, having found the situation as strange as I did. The police escorted him off the property and ensured that he understood the seriousness of the situation. I genuinely couldn't believe that he actually travelled to the address, thinking that somehow I was either going to hook up with him, or that something else was going to happen. What a whirlwind of events, caused by a simple misclick on my phone. In the aftermath, I couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of the situation. I'll be honest, from now on, I'm absolutely terrified when I copy and paste anything to send to anyone other than my close friends or family. I use something called a word third party. It's a saying I made up. If I want to copy and paste something to someone I don't really know, then I'll copy and paste into a word document, just double checking that that's actually what's copied onto the device. It's stupid, I know, but all habits that stem from trauma are extremely stupid and irrational.
Hey everyone, this is the end of tonight's video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment down below your opinions, and also subscribe if you're new to stay up to date with all of my videos that I post every single evening. Here on this channel, I try to bring you brand new and all of the latest horror stories. It's not easy, and in return, I ask for your support. No, I don't sell a stupid merch line or a mug or a t-shirt, and I don't beg for donations on Patreon or Patreon or however you say it. Instead, all I ask is that you interact with my videos by liking and obviously commenting down below. If you want to go the extra mile, then you can always share my videos with your own followers, your family, your friends, and help me spread the word of my channel. It's very difficult, and as I've said this message a million times, those of you that have been watching my channel for months now will know that I always say it's very difficult to grow this channel because of all the AI channels and all the big companies that create horror story channels. So the little guys get squashed. It's down to you guys to support the independent storytellers and horror story channels. So please continue to help me by watching, sharing and liking. Thank you everyone and I'll catch you in tomorrow evening's video.